The mission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. All right, you can be seated. Y'all have had a good night of rest. Appreciate everybody coming out to be at the Lord's house this morning. And uh, thankful for what the Lord did this weekend. Amen. Thankful for the souls that was saved. Thankful for the sermons that was preached. The Lord definitely sent His Word. And uh, it, just, it was just good. Amen. It was just good. And I appreciate uh, all the hands that participated. There was so much work that was done. And uh, it is... It, it doesn't go without noting, amen, that uh, God's people got busy doing what they could for the work of the Lord. And so uh, I appreciate that. I'm very thankful, and I never, I never, uh, it never ceases to amaze me at how much uh, gratitude that we get from the other churches, amen. All day today, thus far, last night, I just kept getting messages about how these churches were thankful to come be with us. And uh, it's just a joy to be in this service for the Lord, amen? And it's a pleasure, it's an honor, it's a privilege. And so today we just want to give the Lord praise and not fail Him to thank Him for what, what God allowed us to do this weekend. I want to say also that uh, I appreciated uh, the good food, and we had a bunch of good food left over. And so... Uh, um, Aaron Pickard, he uh, smoked that meat for us and took care of all that, and we had a lot left over. And so uh, the ladies came to me and said, let's save this over and have a, a lunch together after service this morning. So anybody that wants to eat with us will have pulled pork uh, downstairs immediately following the service with some fixings. It'll be good. And uh, I asked Heather before service what she wanted me to say, and she said, tell everybody to eat. That's all I know to say. <laughs> Amen. She said, there's a lot of food to be eat. And so uh, get you a free meal today, and that'll be a blessing, okay? And it is good. Somebody help me. It is good. And so uh, I appreciate that. But most of all, I just appreciate the presence of the Lord. Amen? It's amazing when you go into a place and the Lord just stirs. Last night, um, we had a little bit of a scare. We had one girl have a sugar problem and went down. A lot of people didn't even know it. Um, but right when we started singing... Uh, she went down, and a handful of them took her out, and ambulance came and checked her blood sugar, and it was okay by the time they got there, but they said all we can say is that it was her blood sugar. Right, Miss Ann? It was okay when they got there. So, uh, But a lot of people didn't even know that, and uh, um, you know that was when, the, when we were singing and the young people were singing, and then my brother, uh, Brother Paul, he got up to preach, and I was sitting over on the side there beside Brother Roger Buck, and Paul... Paul was in a different gear, if you will. He was in a different gear. He he just kind of just kind of eased through his message. And at one point, Brother Roger Buck turned to me and he said, uh, "He said, do you hear the Holy Spirit in this place like that?" And I said, "I sure do, brother." And with with tears running off his cheeks, and and it was just that kind of a sobering, holy hush of a of a service. And uh, I appreciated my brother. He he poured his heart out about time and how that we don't have a whole lot of time but what time we do have is a gift from God amen and that we should utilize that so very convicting very sobering thought you just want to soak it all in I just want to soak it all in last night after the services we of course are tearing everything down and I'm seeing our church family working together, working hard to get everything tore down over there, brought back over here, and get the AB Gymnastics place cleaned up. We went over there, and 
Some was vacuuming, some was packing out trash, some was trying to do flips on the trampoline, amen. <laughs> I thought Josiah died one time. He jumped off this thing on the trampoline and just wilted. <laughs> it was something. But uh, I just want to soak it in. Why? Because we'll never get that back. Now, I don't want to live in the past so much that I don't appreciate where we're headed and, and be focused on that as well. But... Uh, I got home last night and uh, went to my kids' bedroom, and I was helping them get their jammies on, and uh, oh, what a blast. And I'm sitting in the floor, and I, I'm playing with Ada inside, and they're talking all kinds of nonsense and telling me what they did at their grand's house. He said, what are you doing, Brother Cub? I'm just wanting to appreciate what God's doing in my life. Amen. I want to appreciate what's going on right now. I want to soak it in. And I don't want to sit back and just let it go by without being thankful. It convicted me. I'm not going to lie. And so uh, I want to do that this morning with my church family. I just want to soak it in. I want to look around and give God praise for what I see God doing. And I don't want to fail God to give him praise. Amen. And to give him thanks. But uh, from the bottom of my heart, church family, thank you. Thank you for letting our young people participate in such a thing. Thank you for coming out and supporting it. Thank you for every dollar that was spent, every every ounce of energy that was expended. It was all worth it. Amen. I uh, had one young lady come up to me, and she was from a church in uh, Hodgenville. And it's interesting how God does things. Her uh, her dad, she she was adopted by her daddy. Her daddy married her biological mama. And her daddy adopted her. And his name is McKenna. And I grew up with him. He was one of my best friends as a kid. He would come to our church, and you can ask Zach Barry and Chef. Every Sunday, he asked me if I'd come stay the night with him. Every Sunday. And McKenna fell out of church. He just struggled. Some of us do. Amen, church? And he kind of went on a, I don't know, a sabbatical, if you will. And and he was my best friend for a while there, wasn't he, Heather? He, we was always together, fishing and hunting and hanging out. And McKenna just kind of fell off the face of the earth. When McKenna started going to that church, he married this woman, adopted that girl. That girl's 18 years old. She got saved this weekend. Got born again. I didn't even know. I knew they were coming. I, I, I contacted the, the pastor there, Brother Nathan, Nathan tells me, he's like, I got a girl who just started coming. He said, her dad has been coming. He's, he's, you know, he's kind of struggled through life. And he kind of started describing the man. And I said, is he McKenna? <laughs> he said, yeah, he's McKenna, McKenna Acres. He said, you know him? I said, I grew up with him. And then I was standing over here at the AB Gymnastics, and she comes up to me. She's got this, she's a little bitty girl. She's 18, look 12. And she's got on a LaRue County Leatherman jacket. It looked like it was three sizes too big. <laughs> I said, well, I just want to tell you something, young lady. I didn't even know her. I said, I'm glad you're here. You're a blessing to me, but I'm from Greene County, and we hate LaRue County. That's what I told her. Amen. <laughs> she said, I understand completely. She said, uh, you may know my daddy. I said, your daddy? I said, you mean your stepdaddy? Because then I started putting things together. She said, no. She said, he adopted me. She said, McKenna Acres. I said, yeah, I know him well. And I didn't even realize this. She said, yeah. She said, I'm real glad I came to this. This was on Saturday. She said, I got saved last night. Just a handful of purpose just dropped right on top of me. Ain't it worth it all, friend? Amen. It's worth every dollar. It's worth every dime. worth every ounce of energy. It's worth every hour of lost sleep. And, and some of y'all say amen right there. It's worth every struggle. It's worth every heartache because God's in control and he just does things like that. <laughs> and I didn't even ask him for it because that's the God we serve. Brother John called him a miraculous God. Amen. Amen. He's the God that does exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And I'm overwhelmed at his grace this morning. I wanted to share that with you. I thought that'd be a blessing. And... Uh, I want to pray together with my church family this morning, okay? So uh, let's just do that. Brother Beckham, go ahead and play something softly for us. Everybody that can, let's gather in around the altar. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Let's be sure to give God praise and thanks again.
for what he did in the meeting. And let's be sure to spend some time asking God to continue to touch and help our church through the meeting. We've been praying on that coordinate list. We've been praying together. Lord, grow our church. Grow our church in our spirituality. Grow our church in our unity. Grow our church in our maturity. Grow us, God. We need to be grown for you, God. As you pray, ask the Lord to help us to grow. And please help me give God praise for doing stuff like we couldn't have even wrote in a book. We couldn't have imagined it. Heavenly Father, God, you've been abundantly better than I ever imagined. And Lord, I thank you for everything, God. I want to say I thank you for God's people today that, uh, that never cease to amaze me at their support, Lord, their sacrifice and their service, God. It's, it's a wonderful thing to see the people of God get together and band together and do something, God, for you. Lord, I'm unworthy to stand here today. There are many better. Lord, I pray that you forgive me for being me because, Lord, I know what I am and I'm sorry. God, I thank you for saving them souls. Thank you, Lord, for doing what only you can, God. Thank you, Lord, for being for us, Lord, what you would have us. Lord, and I pray desperately, God, again, that you would continue to help our church. Lord, grow us. Help us to grow in, in our mindset, Lord. Help us to grow in our faith, God. Help us to grow, Lord, and be more for you, Lord. We want to be more for you. We want to, Lord, we want to get past the sincere milk of the word, and we want to become, Lord, meat eaters for Christ, God. And we want to trust in you and trust in your word and know what your word says and believe in it and hold it fast, God. I pray, Lord, for those that made decisions this weekend for you. I pray you'd help them and, Lord, strengthen them and encourage them. But I pray we wouldn't waste our time. What a gift time is, God. What a gift time is. And Lord, I pray you'd help us not to waste it, but to give it to you. Or touch our church this morning. Touch our services today. We want to do your will. We want to have your will, God. Lord, I pray that everything that's done would be done for your honor and Lord, for your glory. Help us to obey you. Help us to serve you. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. do want to announce a couple things. I want to mention the camp meeting over at Canaan Baptist Church. And so uh, Brother Curtis did come to me and he wanted me to tell my church family, anybody that wants to go and be there uh, and wants a place to stay, uh, let me know and I'll let them know and you can have a place to stay. But, uh, and that's, that's Sunday through Saturday. And that Friday and Saturday, they're going to have youth-focused services. And we are planning on taking our young people, okay? Brother Zach? As far as I know, I, I, I have already talked to all the youth. If I miss somebody, come to me like you want to go. Amen. That's simple. So if you uh, haven't already and you are wanting to go, let Brother Zach know. If you're not a young person and you want to go, let me know. And I mean that. Brother Curtis emphasized that. He said, this is open for everybody. And I know sometimes we shy away from services that we hear youth because we don't want to distract or get in the way. But uh, I, it never ceases to amaze me, all the, all the people that come to me and say how the youth-focused meetings help them. Amen? I'm thankful for focusing on youth. We need to. That's a, that's a fact. Uh, so many times young people make decisions that affect the rest of their life in those type meetings, teen camp, youth rally, youth retreat, things like that. Uh, but it's not just for them. When God's word's being preached, it's for everybody. And some of the best meetings and some of the most help I've gotten since I've been a pastor has been in those type services. And so anybody and everybody that wants to go, I strongly encourage you come, participate, 
and the Lord will surely bless you for that, okay? Uh, don't forget, ladies, Bible study, Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., and uh, if you can help, uh, we'd surely like for you to help us clean in the church. The sign-ups are uh, in the foyer, and, uh, and if you want to help with junior church cooking, see Miss Heather. She will put you to work, and that'll be a blessing to you. All right, I don't think we've got any new birthdays. Have I missed any birthdays this week? Anybody had a birthday? No? Okay. What about anniversary? Anybody at all? Oh, hands over there. I missed a hand. CJ had one yesterday, the day before yesterday, and I and I, I was standing up here, Brother Joe, and I thought, I told somebody happy birthday at youth retreat. And then I thought, maybe it was at a different church. Are you excited about it, CJ? Yeah. Are you an old man now? Yeah. No. <laughs> How old are you? Nine? Well, you better get a job, son. When you're 12. Okay, church, that's the number now. Who'd have thunk it? Stand up here. We ain't done. What are you thinking, then, boy? Nine years old. How does it feel to be nine now? Did you wake up this morning, your back hurting? No? No, you're good? You're going to be all right? Happy birthday, buddy. Let's give him a hand clap, church. Happy birthday. Now you can sit down. Now you can sit down. Awesome. Thank you, Brother Beckham. I missed him. All right. Well, again, it's good to be here, ain't it? Good to be around God's people. And so uh, let's go to church together. Young people, why don't you come? Brother Beckham, play some of that you just playing as they come. Young people, let's come sing in the choir a little bit this morning for church service. He said, manna from above. When you needed shelter, he covered you with his love. Look what God has done for you. Yeah. 
do not deserve all that he's done for me but i'll praise him forever through eternity
and I want to do something with my time for him and I want to give it back to him he's been so good to me and he has blessed me more than I have ever deserved and I'm just so unworthy of all his love and his grace and I just want to praise him for that this morning because he's been so good to me when he didn't he didn't have to be I don't deserve it but he's good anyways Thank the Lord for saving me this morning. I began to think about the message this weekend. I was thinking a little bit this morning about Brother Josh's message from yesterday. He began to talk about how how there's he, he began to talk about how there's different, different young people in that have come to camp and the ones that ones that would end up walking away years later. And I began to think about the times that. I've had to watch some, some of my friends that I grew up with in church. They both There's people that I've looked up to and they, they just kind of fall away. But I'm thankful that God is still faithful to me. Even, even in the midst of that, God is still faithful. God will always be faithful. And I just, I'm thankful of all that God's brought me through, that God has brought me through. I don't want to fail him to give him praise, to give him thanks. And I, and I was, and I was thinking about this last night of all the, even though the Lord helped us there, he used to treat, there was a lot of things that went wrong, a lot of things that hindered the meeting. And we could either focus on that, or we could focus on the good things of what God did do. He saved four young people Friday night. And, and that's worth it to me, friend. It's worth it to see somebody get saved. They are face a mountain oh so high And I do not know what's waiting on the other side But I know enough to know he'll see me through again I'm glad to know it's in the same. 
was over at the gymnastics place last night and uh, cleaning, watching Cy and Elijah crumble on them trampolines. He said a while ago it looked like you melt. I mean, it looked like Cy and Elijah was melting into that trampoline. But I'm standing there in awe of what the Lord did this weekend. Of how many kids we had come, how many families we had here represented at our by our church. And so oftentimes we go through a meeting, we we pray that the Lord will do things for us and that he'll answer specific prayer requests, like us praying for the Lord to change the weather. And all week it looked like we was going to get two-tenths of an inch of ice. And we wake up Friday morning and there's just a dusting of snow. The roads are clear and fine. All the groups that were supposed to get three-quarters of an inch to an inch of ice still were able to make it down. And sometimes we get to a meeting like that and we just forget about those things, those prayers that the Lord answered. Let's not be quick to forget those prayers this weekend. We get up and we thank the Lord for saving us and we thank him for answering our prayers. Sometimes we don't speci specifically thank him for things he's done. I want to thank him for answering those prayers this weekend. I want to thank him for the souls that were saved because that's what it's all about. We can come in here and we can, we can spend thousands of dollars and we can have the nicest facility. We can have the best sound set up. Brother Caleb can, can speak eloquently. But if the Lord ain't here and souls aren't getting saved, it's for nothing. And so oftentimes we lose focus of what it's on. And I just want to thank him that he allowed us to have a part that four people don't have to go to hell. I just want to thank him this morning for what he's done this weekend for me and my family and for our church. Would there be somebody with a word on your heart, something you want to say or do at this time? Anything at all? Aiden. Amen. Would there be another? Amen. And as I was going to say, what a big teacher. And there's been times in my life when I, in my life when I have uh, but this is taking me to another level. I didn't want to hear that. This week has been such a blessing. Amen. 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 Will there be another this morning? All hearts free. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sis. Brother Beckham. Amen. Amen. Will there be another? Anybody at all? Amen.
Oh, you're mine. Oh, you're mine, bro. We missed you. I told him last night, Brother Caleb. I feel like it's been six weeks since I saw him. <laughs> well, I was out the week before that. <laughs> well, we're thankful you're back too, Brother Joe. Will there be another with the word on your heart? Yes. Amen, buddy. Thank you. Somebody else. Listen, we don't have no set schedule today. We're just going to let the Lord do his, what he wants to do this morning. Will there be somebody else with a word on your heart? Amen. After what we thought we were going to have, we came to gospel, and it was different. Amen. And he was like, let the spirit, and it was always in vain, but I don't know, but I feel something different. Amen. Amen. He's better to us than we deserve, and he always will be. Will there be somebody else? All hearts free? All right, okay. By all means, anybody else want to testify to uh, the goodness of God this morning? Anybody else? Don't want to rush this. I like what Brother Beckham said, is that uh, it was a miracle. It was teetering. And like what Miss Ann said, that uh, that sky was pretty. Last night we got home, and I had signed a truck with me, which he didn't want to ride with me in my truck. I mean, what kind of boy? Hey, man, he just loves to torment me. And uh, I get home, I get him out, he looks up, and boy, that night sky was just bright and gorgeous. And Sal si looks up and he says, Daddy, he said, look at them stars. <laughs> I said, yeah, ain't they beautiful? He said, why can't we see them in the daytime? I said, well, the sun's too bright, son. And when that sun goes down, you can see it. And then it was just a litany of million questions and Sitting there on that piano, I, I was reminded by that, by what Miss Ann said, because of how clear that sky was. 50 degrees on Wednesday, amen, <laughs> down in the teens and ice and snow and, and then the move of God and the Spirit of the Lord. Anybody else want to brag on him real quick? Heather, you care to say something? You want me to make you? That's okay. I don't care to make you. Um, I was just very thankful that everything went smoothly. There were lots. There were things that we didn't even know were going wrong. Yeah. Like that the heat and air were not even. Yeah, going good. All it's like when you know you're worried about all these things. We didn't even know we needed to be worried about that, but it was okay. Apparently, um, but I'm just very thankful that. For all of the help and all of the people who were able to come, and uh, I don't know that I have ever been more tired than I was last night, but it is—it's all worth it to see that Feel the Lord worked and moved, and you know that there were some saved and people got help, and all of the—you know—this is what we needed, and we're so glad that we were able to have it, and it does it makes it all worth it. And there were lots of people bragging on you all and how. How much help we have, how many 
people we have that just jump in and do and are glad to do it. And just I appreciate our church people for all of their support, the money and the food and the time that everybody is willing to put into it. Because it is, it's worth it even if you are completely exhausted and broke and <laughs> whatever else you end up at the end of music. Amen. It is awesome. Amen, Heather. Thank you, darling. Last night, Miss Emily Farley, she taught me, she said, we always know that your meeting is going to be a blessing because of how hard it is for it to happen. She was like, there's always weather and there's always all these things. She's like, she's like, maybe one day God will just let it be an easy one. And I'm like, well, you know, it's just part of it, I guess. You go through all the, all the crazy and you know, it's going to work because of how hard it was to get there. Yeah, it was quite the adventure, <laughs> quite the adventure. As Heather mentioned, the maintenance man informed Brother Chris that they got a new system, and he didn't know anything was going on, so he just left the heat off, so we said. At 60, in the gymnasium and in the cafeteria. Just had no idea. Sent one group over to the Alligator Inn. Woman comes out with a bearded dragon this long, <laughs> passing it around. <laughs> Heather said, I guess that's why they call it the alligator in. Amen. <laughs> I mean, just all kinds of nonsense. So, oh, it's a blast, ain't it? And all for the glory of God. All for his glory. All for his honor. And uh, this, is what you, uh, this is what you get when you try to have a winter meeting. And it's worth it. It's worth it. One preacher said it this way this weekend. He said, you know, we have... Uh, so much that we get involved with throughout the warm weather and the fall and in the spring. He said, by the time we get here, his words were, I need this. And I do too. I do too. Anybody else want to brag on the Lord real quick? Anything at all? I like the sweetness of the fellowship of God's people. Amen. And the worship of the Holy Spirit. Grab your Bibles. Turn the book of, uh, go ahead and turn over to the book of 1 Chronicles 13. 1 Chronicles 13. And uh, I want to try to cap off the weekend with an encouragement for God's people. That's what I want to do. I want to show you something in the scripture and give you a reminder as to um, where a man made a mistake, and then I want to show you how a man uh, made the right decision and uh, allowed the Lord to teach him something from his, from his experience with God that changed his, not, let me say this, not only his family, but his life's family forever, okay? And I've got a little bit of backstory before I get to 1 Chronicles 13. But back in the book of Exodus 25, again, y'all don't have to flip there, but in the book of Exodus 25, you know what you'll find? Is you'll find where God gave Moses and the people of Israel instructions on how to build the Ark of the Covenant and how to transport the Ark of the Covenant. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Under the Ark of the Covenant, there was gold rings fastened to it for rods to run through so that a specific group of men could lift the Ark of the Covenant up and carry it on their shoulders. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And it was only to be carried by those men and in that fashion, according to the scriptures in the book of Exodus 25. And what you find is you find that uh, throughout the history of the people of Israel, they struggled with how they were to transport, how they were to handle the Ark of the Covenant, which is the literal presence of God. The literal presence of God. Now, we no longer need an Ark of the Covenant today. Amen? Why? Because according to the Scriptures, we have His presence down inside of our heart. Amen? And that, uh, that veil of partition was rent when Jesus Christ died on the cross, which opened up the holiest of holies where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt and allowed His presence to come out into man. 
Say, so why are you saying all that? Because I think it's important to see how the presence of God was treated and how that we should appreciate it and maybe how that we should handle it. Amen? With care and with, with sobriety and understand that it's a precious and very important thing that God would be with us. Amen. And so the people of Israel, they knew how they were supposed to handle it and they knew how they were supposed to be. And yet what you find when you study the Scriptures is you find that they walked away from God. You find that they literally were being led by men uh, who were wicked and using their position uh, in, their, in their nation, their religious positions, to take advantage of people. You read about how over in the book of uh, 1 Samuel and chapter 4 and 5, you read about how that a man by the name of Eli, who was a judge of Israel and who was a priest, failed to teach his boys what was right. The Bible says that because Eli refrained his children, his boys did not refrain them from being evil, the Bible said they made themselves evil. Amen. Let me say that again. Amen. Amen. When you, when you rear a child, you have to refrain them. Why? Because inside of a man is a desire that came down through all of the lineage to cause him to want to be evil, and it's our duty to train them right. Eli didn't do that. He let them do whatever they wanted. He put them in the right position. He put them in the right places. He had them around the right things. But when they veered from what was right, he never said otherwise. He just hoped that being around God's people, being at youth retreat, if you will, or, or being at Sunday school or being at teen camp would take care of them and we wouldn't have to do with them, anything with them at home and that'll be all right. No, mom, dad, listen, things have to be done at home in order to teach them what's right. I'm all for going to youth retreat and those things changed my life. But guess where my life was really molded? At home. At home. And Eli failed. And his boys were priests. And they were being paid by people with wicked and heinous activities in order to try to take care of them religiously. Well, guess what God did? God brought judgment on the sons of Eli and they died. And when all that took place, the Ark of the Covenant was taken. And the Philistines took it, according to the Scriptures. And when the Philistines took it, y'all know the passage. I've, I actually mentioned some of these things in a recent message. They placed the Ark of the Covenant in the house of a false god of theirs called uh, Dagon. And uh, they left, and when they came back, that fake god, that false god, was knocked down on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. They set it back up again, and the next time, the head of that false god was broke off of it, laying on its face in front of the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the real, true God. Amen. Well, what then happened? Well, the Philistines started having terrible judgment placed on them, and they were miserable, and it was like a light bulb went off, and they realized this is because we have the Ark of the Covenant here and we don't know what to do with it and we don't serve that God and the God of the Jews, the God of the Israelites is judging us. So what did they do? Well, they take the Ark, they put it on a real nice cart, and they hook it to some cows and they send it out of town. And the Ark of the Covenant lands at a place uh, under the care of the house of Abinadab there in 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now don't go there. I'm just giving you some backstory before we get to 1 Corinthians 13. But, uh, or 1 Chronicles, excuse me. 1 Chronicles 13. But uh, <clears throat> it's here that we realize that those Philistines handled it completely wrong. And even though they did it wrong, church... And even though they did it against the way that God specifically told Israel to do it, we find that the Philistines had an influence on Israel nonetheless. First, Corinthians, or First Chronicles 13, if you're there, say amen. Look at verse 1. Notice, the Bible says, And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and every leader. And David said unto the congregation of Israel, If it seemed good unto you... And that it be of the Lord uh, the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere 
that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also in the priests and Levites, which uh, are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us, and let us bring again the ark of, of, God, of our God to us. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul, and all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of the people. And so their desire was correct, amen? They wanted to go get the presence of God and bring it back and do it and, and get God back with them and get back right with God, if you will. Amen, church? Notice verse 5. So David gathered all Israel together from Shahor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hamath, uh, uh, to bring the ark of God from Kirjath Jerem. And David went up, and all Israel to uh, Bala, uh, that is Kirjath Jerem, uh, which belongeth to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God the Lord that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio uh, drave the cart. And David and all the people played uh, before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. And so what do we see here? We see quite the scene, amen? I mean, my goodness, they've got the, they've got the ark. They've put it on a brand new cart. They want the whole world to see. And now they're making a scene and they're playing music and singing songs and trying to really blow this thing up into something that it was never intended to be. Notice what happens in verse 9. When they came unto the threshing floor of Shidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Boy, it looked cool, I bet, to have these big old bulky beasts hooked to that cart and pull the ark of God I mean, I bet it looked nice. I bet everybody out there thought, wow, what a wealthy people that's got such means to transport their God. But now we see why God didn't uh, intend for it to be that way. Because they're beasts. And the oxen, the Bible said, stumbled. And so you can imagine in your mind, you can see as the cart maybe shifts, you can see maybe as uh, uh, the ark teeters, and you can see a man who thought to himself, I don't want this to fall. And what does he do? He merely puts forth his hand to stop it from falling over. And then the Bible tells us this. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand on the ark, and there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called... Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God uh, that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to him, uh, to himself, to the city of David. Notice, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord, notice, blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Here we have some contrasting experiences with the presence of God. Here we have two different people, and we see the difference of how they handled God and His reality and the importance of His presence, the precious nature of having God in your house. And we see how God dealt with them because of it. First, I want you to notice the mistake of David. We see David was compromising in how he handled God's presence. David was compromising in how he handled God's presence. Are y'all listening to me this morning? If you're with me, say amen. I praise the Lord. We were able to have this youth retreat this year. The vast majority of the songs we sung were merely hymnals. And God began to breathe into that place with around 200 young people, give or take, just young people. Now we have more adults, but I'm just talking about the young people. Around 200 young people, give or take, merely singing some hymnals. 
One that God really began to breathe into that place was when we got to sing in My Savior's Love. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. Are y'all listening? We didn't dim the lights. We didn't have to put a light show up. I didn't, nor could I ever, put on a pair of skinny pants. Amen. Ain't nobody wants to see that mess. Anywho. Amen. I'm fully aware of such. I didn't have a, you know, some kind of V-neck with a gang chain. Help me. I wasn't up in front of the church, listen, doing in a dance to some new country music song, which apparently just went down in some big mega church here in America. Are y'all listening to me? We didn't, we, didn't have to, we didn't have to bring in anything that the world had to offer when it came to the presence of God. And I got to stand up and watch and hear young people make moves towards God, express worship towards God without the influence of a compromised worship style. It's vitally important. It's vitally important. You say, Brother Shirley, what about how much they, what about that, what about that? Listen to me. Listen to me. You ready? It still works. The scriptures still work. If you have a problem, listen to me. I don't have the time to deal with this today. If you have a problem with my preaching on music style, come see me. We'll sit down. I'll take the Bible. We'll wade through the scriptures. I wish Miss Michelle was here today. I'll never forget Miss Michelle's testimony about how that when I was first here, I preached a message on music, Brother Seth. Men like you and me's heard it our whole life because we were raised in it. Miss Michelle said, I'd never heard such, and it ticked her off. That was her testimony. She said, I got mad at you, Brother Caleb, because you preached on my music. And she no-showed us. She fell off the face of the earth. And finally, one day, she come back, and she testified to how God convicted her heart and showed her that the Scriptures were true. Music is a very important, important thing. Think about how music has played a role in society. Oh, it's, it's in everything. It's everywhere. My goodness, I, there was a boy at youth retreat. He was this tall, and he had a T-shirt on said ACDC. I'm thinking, what are you, nine? <laughs> you don't even know what ACDC is. You don't have a clue what you're dealing with there. Why? Because music has influenced every facet of our society. Every show, there's a new Disney movie. Uh, uh, Noel was over at the house and uh, turned it on. And man, Elijah, Elijah is singing to some of those Disney songs. Why? Because it gets you moving, man. It does something to you. Music is important. Amen, church? Amen, Amen church? How we handle the presence of God is vitally important. David and them was making a scene. And every, listen, everything they were doing here, they got from the world. Put it on a new cart, made a big triumphant thing to try to show the world what they were doing. Listen, God's presence has nothing to do, listen, with man's pride. David was compromising. David patterned his service after the Philistines and was using their idea in the new cart. I'm just not interested in trying to learn from what the world does. Seen recently where a pastor had went and he went over to the other side of the U.S., went in this big old mega church, and he simply said, I just want to see how they were doing things because I thought maybe our church could learn something from them. How about we just open the Bible, <laughs> help me, and just Amen. learn what the Bible says. Amen? Amen? Like, I just Amen. don't care nothing about trying to learn from somebody that ain't interested in what thus saith the Word of God. David patterned after the world. That's his compromise. David, we notice his contemplation. David had to release, or ra rather, David had to reason in order to contemplate and come to this conclusion instead of confiding, listen to me, church, in what, in what the Lord had given Moses on how to do what he was trying to do with the press. All he had... To, Listen to me, church. They didn't have a printing press when David was king. Do y'all understand? But guess what David was? King. 
He had the scriptures. As king, guess what David was required to do? Handwrite all the scriptures. Every king of Israel was required to handwrite their own copy of all the scriptures for themselves, by themselves. He knew what Moses said. He knew what God told Moses. What did he do? He refused to confide in what the scripture said to do and thought, I liked how them Philistines did it. That looked good. Contemplating. Stop contemplating with what God's already settled in His Word. Stop trying to manipulate the Scriptures. Stop trying to confide in anything other than what thus saith the Word of God. We see the catastrophe. What happened? Somebody died. Somebody died. Somebody lost their life. See, that's the danger. That's the danger. He said, Brother Shirley, we could have so much more. We could see so much more. We could experience so much more. Growing up, where I come from there in Greene County, they used to have something every year. A fest. And they would ban all these churches together. It was very ecumenical. All the churches. Every church in the area. And listen to me. <laughs> I didn't want to be disrespectful. And I liked and cared about a lot of people that thought a lot of that meeting. And there was a lot of people that supposedly got saved. I think about one individual that went to this fest that they have over in that area. And there would be 10, 15, 20 churches a lot of times there. And it didn't matter if you was Methodist, Nazarene, Presbyterian, Church of Christ. Everybody went. And, and, uh, Pentecostal, non-denominational. And what, you know what it was? It was a big confusion, confusing mess. I seen one video at one point where a bunch of boys was standing in the middle of a church sanctuary and trying to, trying to have a mosh pit of some sort. Are y'all listening? And calling it, calling it church, calling it, calling it something from, from, that had something to do with God and, and Christianity. Are you listening to me? And I remember a peer of mine coming back to school and claiming he got saved. And I'll never forget the day where I heard that he committed a heinous act to a young lady and is now spending time in jail over it. And he never ch darkened the church door ever again. And listen to me, he is a catastrophe. Why? Because he went somewhere and seen them doing something and they called it Christianity and they called it church and they tried to act like God had something to do with it when at the end of the day, you know what it was? It was them adopting an, an act and a practice from the world and trying to put Jesus' name on it. Amen. You know what it causes? Catastrophes. It causes confusion. It causes young people and, and, and adults alike not to understand what God expects out of them. Now listen to me today, church. The reason I do my best to associate with those that, that are of what we call the Baptist doctrine is because I believe the Baptist doctrine is the closest thing to that book. You listen to me. I'm talking about the Bible. And if look here. If the Baptist doctrine abandoned this, we'd find something else to be tomorrow. Amen. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Because the, being a Baptist don't make you a Christian. I just simply believe, according to the Scriptures, being a Baptist and believing in what's called soul liberty and trusting in the Bible makes you correct. And, and, and it makes no sense to try and adopt the way that the world's doing it. To try to be what the world is. Why? It causes catastrophes. It causes casualties. People lose their life and die lost and go to hell. This was David's mistake. Then we see the miracle of Obed-Edom. The Bible says that they dropped this presence of God off at the house of Obed-Edom. And Obed-Edom come to experience what it's like, listen to me now, to have God's presence in his home. If you don't know what it's like to have the presence of God inside of the place that you dwell, you don't know what you're missing out on.
You don't know what it's like to get up in the morning and have God's peace inside of your house. If your house is littered with sin and shame and resistance and rebellion and fighting and strife, listen to me, friend of mine, then you don't know what it's like to experience the miracle that Obed-Edom is experiencing here. Here in this house, Obed-Edom began to see what it was like to have God's presence, to have God's power, to have God's provision. The Bible said the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. I'll never forget listening to what my gurney said that day when I was writing that paper about her. I said, gurney, I said, what was the reason that you stuck with it? Why did you just sell out to God back when you did? What was it about? What was happening around you? And she looked at me and she said, Caleb, when I got a taste of the real thing, she said, nothing else I had ever experienced could ever relate or compared to what God did inside of me that day. And she said it was in that moment I knew I'm just going to live for Him no matter what the world says. And she spent years experiencing struggles with my papa who went through some bouts of extreme struggles and extreme troubles and extreme trials. And Gurney just kept on chugging along and she just kept on walking toward God and she just kept taking her boys to church and she just kept putting me Tammy in the choir. Why, friend? Because she got a taste. Because she got the real thing. And when you get the real thing, won't nothing else ever satisfy that. Obed Edom got a taste of the real thing. Say, how do you know that, Brother Shirley? Well, we see next David's modification. David wakes up in chapter 15. David realizes, oh my goodness, we've left the presence of God down there and we're struggling as a nation. And God's presence down there. And look at old Bed Edom's house. My goodness, how they're blessed. And there in chapter 15, you read about how David says, fine, let's go get it. Let's do it the right way. Let me tell you something I don't ever want to get above. Making a correction. Making a correction. And in my life and in my ministry, I've had to do it many times. I've had to do it recently. In my life and ministry recently, I've had to get on the phone with some preachers and say, I want you to know something. I'm sorry. I was allowing some things to go on in my life. I was allowing some things to go on in my ministry. You've seen it, and I'm afraid maybe I've influenced you with that, and I'm sorry. I don't want no part of it. You say, like what? I'm just going to be real with you right here. Allowing Hillsong songs sung by our young people. I detest totally these modern music producers. I detest everything about them. They write these songs and they pass the sniff test. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like what? Like they don't say anything real serious about doctrine. And in it, they don't say anything about really how they believe. They just talk about Jesus and how good He is. And there's a lot of churches and a lot of pastors that have adopted it. I'm just pouring my heart out to you right here. And there's been some songs that we've participated in singing that I've allowed ignorantly. You want to know why? It's hurting our young people. Let me tell you a tactic of this church and this ideology. They write these simple songs that just don't, they pass the sniff test. It's not that big a deal. And we sing it. And we sing it right, don't we? We get on the piano. We don't try to make a scene. We don't do all that stuff. We just sing the music for what it is. Guess what happens to our young people? Because I've seen it happen personally. They go home and they look the song up. Well, guess who the internet's going to pull up singing that song? The one that wrote it. The ones that believe that we're all many gods. The ones that believe in the prosperity gospel. The ones that believe you don't have to do anything different. The grace of God is sufficient to take care of any sin. You can just live in your sin and God's grace is sufficient. You, listen, literally, the ones that believe that you can live in heinous acts of homosexuality and sodomy and that's okay. The ones that's been on big time television programs and refuse to stand against sin. And our young people go home and they hear that and they see that scene. And they think, well, our church is singing this song. Must be okay. Are y'all listening to me? Are y'all listening to the preacher this morning? I'm talking about serious stuff here. And guess what's happening? They're getting a generation with that music. That's how they get them. This music talks about how good God is. It talks about how, how glorious God is. What's the big deal? 
Why ain't it okay? We're singing it at church, Brother Caleb. Are y'all listening? Help me. And boy, I got convicted about it. And this, I mean, I'm talking about it happened to me personally, Brother Seth. And I had to do something about it. Why? Because I ain't above correcting myself. Saying I was wrong. You say, but Brother Charlie, what about so-and-so up the road? Or what about so-and-so that does it? I ain't their God. We believe in what's called soul liberty. They can do what they want. But I just can't do what I want. And, and I'm not living my life based off of them, Brother Seth. Amen. They're not my standard. Amen. Amen. Who's my standard? The Lord's my standard. Right. His Word's my standard. And I'm not perfect, but He's still working on me. I'm still trying to make these corrections. And look here, and I ain't above it. David was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't above it. Are you? David makes a correction. He goes, he gets it done the right way, he brings the presence of God back, and everything is in its proper place, and everything's in order. There in chapter 15, verse 28, the Bible says the people of God celebrated, the ark was brought back, they, 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 uh, they worship the Lord there in song, and everything's great. But I want you to notice, lastly, Obed-Edom's mindset. For three months, for three months, the literal manifested presence of God dwelt with man. And it was in Obed-Edom's house. Where do you find Obed-Edom after David goes and gets the ark? Chapter 15, verse 18. Chapter 15, verse 18. And with them and their brethren of the second degree, Zechariah, Ben, Jezael, Shemaroth, uh, Jehiel, Uni, Eliab, Benaiah, Messiah, Mattathiah, Eliphela, Mekneah, Y'all like all them names I just read? Notice that last one. Obed-Edom and J.L. the porters. You know what a porter is? That's a doorkeeper. That's all that is. That's a doorkeeper. They just maintain the door. Keep people out ain't supposed to be in. Let people in that's supposed to go in. Let people out that's ready to go out. A doorkeeper. Of what? The Ark of the Covenant. Obed-Edom found out what it was like to have God's presence in his house. Guess what he did? He gave his life to it. And guess what capacity that was? Just keep the door. Just keep the door. He was to be a praiser. He was to be a porter. And he was persuaded. If you study your Bible, you'll find out that he's mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 26 and his eight sons. The Bible calls them men of valor. They were leaders of his house. What happened? Listen to me. Obed Edom's house coming to the presence of God and he wanted to live the rest of his days around God's presence and influences, influencing his home to do the same. <laughs> And he said, boy, when I got a taste of the real thing, she said, I wanted to be involved with it. And it ain't got a thing to do with who she is. She's just a regular old simple woman. My gurney and my papa are simple livers. They live in two trailers side by side with a wall cut out of them. Are y'all listening? Simple living style. Half of the back trailer don't even work. They just got it blocked off. Papa goes back there, here and there, uses it for like a garage, throws his tools in there. Nothing special. If my Papa's coming down the road, if he's three miles up the road, you'd know it's him because his truck has a distinctive sound, and it's not pleasant, might I add. Brother William, you feel me, don't you, brother? Amen. Everybody knows Elbert Shirley coming because you can hear him. Simple people. Simple people. They garden their brains out. Why? Because they know... It'll be hard to afford the stuff that they can grow on their own. Nothing special. But she gave it to him. And I, I'm telling you, it was no merit of my gurney. And I'll maintain that till I die. She's a simple lady. Her daddy was shot and killed. His name was Teddy Parker in Greensburg, Kentucky. Because he gotten some stuff he shouldn't have gotten into. She was raised by a single mama and her grandparents. God gave her three boys that made preachers. 
That wasn't her. Did you hear me? What was it, Brother Shirley? The presence of God inside that house. There'd be days that wasn't great. But Elbert would come home and he was in a bad way. But guess what was still there? The presence of God. Why? Miss Diana would be in the back praying for him. Now she wasn't perfect. Sometimes she'd get in the flesh. One day he come home in a bad way. She cooked supper. He said something about it. Well, the supper ended up on his head. And then she walked into the bedroom, stuck him in the bed, and he woke up and his hair was like sticky. And he said, Diane, I'm bleeding. I got blood all over me. She went in there and she said, Ever, you ain't got blood on you. You got food on you. Maybe next time you won't talk so bad about that food I cooked you, sir. Hey, Amen. Cleaned him up. Why? She's just a woman. She's just a regular woman. But listen, the presence of God got in that house. She committed to it. And y'all are looking and listening to a man that if it hadn't happened, there's no telling where I'd be this morning. There's no telling. Just simple people. No merit of their own. But man, when they got in on the presence of God, they did whatever they could to stay with it. Some of y'all know what that's like. Some of y'all know what that's like. And some of y'all, listen to me, some of y'all are seeing the world and you're seeing this new age stuff and it's, it's getting your attention. It's making you appreciate it. Look at the scene they make. Look at the glory they get. I mean, they're on the news channel. Listen to me, friend. Brother Curtis preached on them false prophets. Wonderful. You be careful. They'll be, look here, they'll be known by their fruits. And all those men that he mentioned, he mentioned a bunch of them. I appreciate him calling some names out. Why? You need to be warned. You need to be warned. You know what you need to be warned of? A copperhead snake. You need to be able to identify a copperhead snake. You need to be able to say, that snake, if it bites me, it's going to be real bad. You need to be able to distinguish it from other snakes. Amen. Or just kill all snakes. Somebody help me. Huh? What are you getting at? I'm talking about just because they make it look good, don't make it God. The importance of God in your home. Have we made mistakes? I've made a bunch of mistakes. I try to be faithful never to be too big to say it when I do. But I know what it's like to have the presence of God in my home by His grace. I know what it's like to look over at Heather and see a tear in her eye because of something Josiah said about God that's only because God's presence is in our home by His grace. I know what it's like to pile in around the couch because we've got a serious thing going on in our home and to see Gabby and Adri and Heather and Sian Ada and me behind them and get down at the couch and pray because something real serious is going on and we have to have God do something to only see, guess what? God did something. And I don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. What about you today, church? How's your home? Is there some corrections need to be made? Do we need to put a better emphasis on the things of God over the things of the world? Do we need to get a priority straightened out? School? Sports? Y'all listening? Do we need to get those things put in the back, back proper order? I'm ashamed to say there were some people that I thought would be there at Youth Treat couldn't because they made some priority shifts and something else got in the way. Think about it. The presence of God. What's more important to you? Let's all stand to our feet. Let's all stand to our feet. Brother Beckham, why don't you come? Let's get a song. We'll have a time of invitation here. Boy, ain't it important to have God in our home? Ain't it important to have God and His presence in our heart? 
Shouldn't we make it a point to do things that involve His presence the scriptural way? Shouldn't we do things and do the best that we can to make sure and maintain that God is orchestrating what we are and what we're doing? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we care? Shouldn't it matter that our home be a home with His presence? And shouldn't that be the most important thing in our life? And if we make the mistake, shouldn't we just make the correction? David was a man after God's own heart, and yet David himself made a mistake, and he made it right. And boy, I'm glad for what obed Edom did. He committed his life. He said, if I can just keep that door, I'll be pleased. Because I know what's inside that door, and what's inside that door made all the difference in my life. How about you today? Are you committed to Him? Are you committed to His presence? What page you got, Brother Connor? Page 323. We're going to sing. I want you to mind the Lord. These altars are open. Why don't you go ahead and come and spend some time talking about being committed to God this morning. Go ahead, Brother Connor. Sing for us. Mind the Lord, church. These and altars are open. We've already got a handful stepped out. Why don't you come? It's a hard ride Ask with the Lord to God. help us today. Countest thou all things for Jesus but lost? It's a hard ride with God. It's a hard ride with God. Washed in the crimson flood. Cleansed and made holy. Humble and lowly. Right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion over self and over sin? It's a hard ride with God. Over all evil without and within. It's a hard ride with God. It's a hard ride with God. Wash in the crimson flood. Cleanse and made holy. Humble and lowly. Right in the side.